Good morning. Uh, we're going to give a presentation on the MLR1KX core, and I'm going to give a very brief introduction, just explaining roughly what it is to anyone who's not that familiar. And then I'm going to hand over to Stefan, who has done all the work lately. Uh, so, next. A little bit about me, I'm a digital design engineer living and working here in Cambridge and I've been involved with the Open Risk project uh, for several years now, ever since I started working at Orsoc in Stockholm and I don't have work there but I'm still involved, it's okay, it's good fun. So one of the things I started about just over two years ago now was this call. And it was a bit of a reaction to the OR1200. So having worked with the OR1200, uh, you know, in my day job, I didn't find it optimal. Um, and a lot of people agreed with me. But anyway, I decided to write my own uh, from the beginning. And the idea was, well, so one of the things that was annoying about working with the OR1200 was that it wasn't well written and it was hard to extend. It was, it was hard to kind of break out a a module and then replace it or extend it. And I mean, if you wanted to go in and change the pipeline to add a, add a stage or something like that, it was almost impossible due to the way it was coded uh, and the way it was just generally designed. So I thought I could do better than that. And I started up a, a little project, just doing a very simple core to begin with. Um, but I made sure that it was a lot more modular and you know, the modularity was better defined, so where, where the different cores uh, interacted so at different stages of a, the CPU pipeline, so I made sure that was a bit more obvious. I made sure that the coding standard was better and signals were named better and um, used better coding conventions, so instead of tick defines everywhere, you instead have parameters, just little things like that. Uh, and I also wanted to make it easier to verify, so just little things inside the pipeline like uh, ways of getting the execution state out of it instead of, well actually this is a bit of a problem we have now because the pipeline has become more complex, but early on it was a lot easier to just figure out exactly what instruction it had done and uh, we could dump instruction traces out of the simulation. So uh, it's been a lot easier to use uh, compared to the IR1200 since day one and it's been a good little bit of work. So. We started off with a, well, basically I, I in a way, copied the OR1200, which was a basic five-stage pipeline. Uh, but then I decided to make a smaller one, which was just a fetch, an execute, and then a write back in kind of control stage. Uh, so that's what it was. It was initially just a three-stage and a five-stage. And then Stefan came along, and he's taken over the, the cappuccino core. That's now a six stage, full of all sorts of wonderful stuff. And he'll talk about that a little bit later, I'm sure. Uh, but the espressos are, well, the espresso is still a normal three stage in order. But then we had uh, Peter Gavin who came along and updated the tool chain to support, uh, well, remove the delay slot uh, requirement, which was nice because that makes the RTL a little bit simpler. Uh, so I wrote a Synthesizable core. Well, I changed the espresso pipeline to not have a delay slot, and that's kind of cool. Should make it simpler. Uh, so the idea is that the espresso cores are mainly aimed at deeply embedded use. So things to run R tosses, lightweight R tosses, um, bare metal software, uh, intended to be quite small. I haven't synthesized it lately for ASIC, but yeah, they're not big. Definitely smaller than a Cortex M3. Uh, but then again, not as many features. So. And again, yeah, the Ponto Espresso without the delay slot should make things a little bit easier. And in practice, that is the case. And the Cappuccino core, faster, more pipeline, more features. Stefan will talk about this more. So that's a quick introduction to what it is, 
Um, if I quickly mention what I've been working on lately is basically taking the espresso. So the bus interface on the espresso core at the moment, uh, it's only really a wishbone interface. And the idea is that you, so there's no cache on it, and the idea is that you can basically execute from streams of instructions coming in over the wishbone bus. But that's not great due to the wishbone bus protocol. Uh, you've got at least, there's no such thing as a zero weight set access on the wishbone bus, which is kind of annoying. So what I'm doing is adding kind of like a ROM or a tightly coupled memory port onto the espressos and in that way you can have a ROM sitting next to it or a tightly coupled RAM, a zero weight state RAM that all, basically all, all of your read only data is in, so your uh, code as well. And then, you know, you execute as quickly as you can out of that. <clears throat> but as well, then you have the system bus that you can go and maybe if you want to execute out a DRAM or something like that, you can do. Um, and that required a complete rewrite of both fetch stages, basically. So I'm still hacking away on that. It kind of works, but I'm not ready to commit it yet. That's, uh, but you want your delay slot back for that? Uh, well, the Espresso supports the delay slot and Pronto Espresso doesn't, and I'm trying to fix both to work with this tightly coupled memory ROM interface. Um, but then the idea is to also make it available to Cappuccino as well. Um, and as well, the verification environment. We were using a forked Orpsoc V2 repository, because um, everybody likes copies of Orpsoc V2 around the internet. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, it was good at the time, but I think we should probably uh, make an effort to Base it on Orpsoc V3 or some sort of unified. It wasn't that good. There were 13 instructions which it took us 10 years to realise hadn't actually been implemented. What wasn't good? Well, <laughs> the, yeah. the original Orpsoc verification environment. Yeah, but that's because the C compiler didn't it? admit them. <laughs> so who cares? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it's the verification environment in general is a lot better. So actually, over the course of the development of the ML1KX, I did write, or well, we've both written a lot of. OL1K generic software, um, both assembly and C, which tests various bits of the, the, the ISA and our implementations. So we now have like a nice little um, code base of generic, you know, process and generic um, test code sitting there that should be unified with probably the AUXIN test code and, and whatever is whatever has el whatever else has been written out there. Um, and so that's probably some a bit of work that needs to go on in parallel with Orpsoc, so that we have a nice build system and then a nice kind of verification code base that we can use. Uh, the details on it are yet to be worked out. Uh, but anyway, we obviously need to do something about the verification of our IP. If I can go on a little bit about, so I talked to the Open Hardware Summit recently and I asked the question why hasn't open source hardware and open source RTL basically not taken off in industry? It's an interesting question because you, you compare open source hardware to open source software, where obviously it's used widely in commercial products. And one of the things I think which is a problem is that just the quality of the code is not good enough for industry. Um, and it, in a way, it's more perception than anything because you know I work in industry, I see the kind of code you get from Synopsis when you pay them lots of money, and actually, quite often, it's not great. But I think. You need to deliver them something that's very, very good if they're going to use it. So we need to make, I think, open source hardware code a lot better. And uh, one of the things, obviously, chip designers are worried about is that it's not going to work. So we need a very, very good verification solution. And I think if we develop something like that, or at least work towards something like that with a, you know, a CPU core, um, that would be a good thing. So I think um, that's a worthwhile. How far have you got with integrating? Because we, when I was involved with Auxin, we built a big regression test suite for Auxin. How far are you getting to unifying that so that the test of the golden reference is the same as the well, test of the target? I just mentioned it's, we're still talking about it. But <laughs> <laughs> um, it needs to be done. I think right now is a good time to do it. Um, good student project. We, well, uh, it's, it's more of an organisational thing, really. It's just copying it somewhere and then designing a, a way to. Or, developing a way for, to access it easily. I don't know whether you put the build scripts in that repository or 
in all sorts of random instructions in there. Random sequence, you know, all sorts of generated from a random number generator constrained to be valid instructions. No, not yet. That's always a good test. Oh, maybe maybe Waka Samad's thesis had that in it? I do know that uh, at Orsok they had some student who did something similar to that, but I don't know the details. Oh, okay. Was that Wackers? So Wackers' argument, MSC, was really on UVM, wasn't it? Yes. And he was the guy who found the 13 instructions that actually weren't there. Right. Um, <laughs> That's because he followed the spec. <laughs> <laughs> and the spec. <laughs> Always getting in the way. No, yeah, compiler, compiler generated and, and uh, handcrafted code are like two profiles. Truly random code is also a good thing for the new balancing process. Yeah, certainly. Uh, but I guess if you do that, then you need a uh, model to also run those instructions through and yeah. compare the state of the two. And which we've got. Oh, yeah, similarly. Yeah, so true. Or is supposed to be the golden reference? True. Supposed. Well, we, we had a late night last night with Whiskey's um, thinking, talking about exactly this actually, how we can set up a system where you had an sim next to you know, an RTL simulation or a very related RTL simulation and double checking the state of each. And it's a little bit tricky because you know, you've got peripherals in the RTL that maybe you don't have in sim, and it would be nice just to have a, a one size fits all sim that you could sit there and run and compare it with your RTL. Certainly some work there needs to go on. And actually, that would be a good student project. I would very much like that. But anyway, for the benefit so. of the academics. <laughs> well, it's very timely. Now is the time to propose. Uh, I'm talking to all of our students this week about their project selections. So I can suggest that one. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, so anyway, that's one thing I would like to focus on. Very broad thing to work on, but I think it would be very beneficial to the project. Anyway, that's all I have to say. Okay, over to the real demo. Okay, so I've done this presentation at more one kx cappuccino barista year of work because it's been. Brewing for a year. <laughs> <laughs> so, first short introduction of what Cappuccini is. It started out as a modification of Julius, kind of, as he mentioned, the four slash five stage pipeline and has been extended from that. So, some things in it had like heritage from that. So it's still going on and <coughs> and the point of it is to try to make as fast and efficient and still keeping it relatively small. So that's the purpose of the cappuccino pipeline. So yeah, so but area isn't the main concern for me. I want want to make it like faster in terms of its instructions per cycle and also how fast you can synthesize it like in terms of frequency, maximum frequency. And we did a short demo last year on the last conference where we showed it running. Yesterday people here got it running. And uh, today I'm going to speak about what's been done since last year. And uh, this was what it looked like last year. So it was a five stage pipeline. And uh, pretty much everything was clumped up in execute stage. Execute stage did a lot of things. It did it. Like branches, what happened in execute stage memory access has happened in execute stage. So basically, whenever the instructions came to execute stage, it stalled there and did the instruction and continued. So, the, yeah, and, and what I had done was uh, add uh, instruction and data cache. So that was basically at the point we were then. Uh, and today we have a six stage pipeline and uh, the other data cache this is still there, still on two ways. Uh, at 
the day might change. That's Stefan is working. The other Stefan is working on, on that, uh, but I come to that later. And uh, I moved the branches to the code stage, and I added a branch predictor to it too. Uh, and uh, memory accesses are moved as they should be in mem stage. And I've added a store buffer to the LSU. And uh, another big thing that was missing from, from Cappuccino last year was the MMUs, so that I have added to. Is and, it, sorry? Is memory protection uh, compatible with uh, predicting the branches in the uh, decode stage, or could you get permissions that are no longer valid? Uh, no, because the branch prediction happens after the MMU. So the MMU is earlier in the pipeline. So it's already when you get, ah, yeah, I get what you mean. Uh, but I have to sit down and consider that a bit more. <laughs> but I, I don't think, I, I, I have thought about it, but I think I have to think about it a bit more actually. But what I think I came, the conclusion I think I came to when I thought about it last was that it can happen. Like that we would get a mispredict that would go through that that shouldn't. But yeah, that's an interesting like side effect of having branch prediction, of course, that you can can get a fetch to a place where you shouldn't go. Like in the end. Can I ask about the memory access and write back? What precisely do you mean by those terms? Or another way of asking my question is. Uh, how many cycles are there through the, the data cache? The so cycles through, well you have the, so the data cache is, is like addressed in execute stage and uh, you get the data back in memory stage. So one clock cycle to yeah. through the, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, and through the MMU. Because, because some people yeah. just, uh, my understanding may be wrong here, but some people, you say that the memory access and the write back stage are sometimes actually just padding in the, in the pipeline so that you get two clock cycles, so you can have two clock cycles delay through the cache. Yeah. Uh, and then you don't get a structural hazard on the right back to the register file where a load and an ALU operation are both completing at the same clock cycle. Mm, yeah. But yeah, it's the same thing. So how many write do you get? Uh, to the Read the file. Yeah. So there is one. Yeah, one. Yeah, one. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, to the MMU I also added something a bit extra that hasn't been in, in the OR1200. It's hardware TLP reload. Okay, so. Yeah, already last year we had better performance than or or twelve hundred, but yeah, the features were missing like the MMU, and there was still a lot of improvements that could be made. So that's basically what I have done the past year. And yeah, the first first thing I did was separating the executor memory stage and. It's like an old thing, it has always been like that. Uh, but I think Julius actually did it his way because he wanted it to make it area efficient and didn't care so much about like one one cycle or one instruction per cycle cycle loads. And since it didn't have any data cache, you kind of still always had to, to stall on the loads anyway. So it wasn't that much of a Big of a deal in the original four stage cap or four stage or one kx. Uh, and uh, the store buffer. It's a very very simple, the simplest store buffer you can think of. It's just the FIFA. Every store goes into the FIFA and. Uh, the pipeline continues until it sees a load on the on the or a load comes in, and uh, at that point, if the store buffer isn't empty, the pipeline stalls until the store buffer is empty, and then it continues. 
So it's a very, very, very simple and naive, but it's it's quite like in practice it it pretty efficient still. And Can it burst? Sorry? Can it do burst right? Mm, no, but that could actually be kind of implemented. But the problem is that we have the wish bun, but or you could do the writes pipeline. That would be of course a lot more efficient if you have like the store buffer filling up, you could do pipeline uh, writes, but well that's uh, supported in the wishbone spec for B or the B4 and we don't have any memory controllers that supports that. So it's not it, it's not doing that. It just does single accesses. So they are kind of slow, but it's still a performance win to do this just because of what I'm gonna show now. Uh, so this is a just a normal C function, a bit silly, it doesn't do anything particularly useful, but it demonstrates the point I'm trying to make. So this is what the compiler would turn this into, and well, it's not optimized, and somebody probably can see directly what it's doing silly. Well, uh, I'm not going to go into that because it's unrelated, but I, it just annoyed me that it, it's doing one silly thing. It's, it's doing the the stack pointer like restore twice. But anyway, uh, so here you see two stores in the beginning, the stack stores. Uh, so without the store buffer, you would have let's say that it's like a four four cycle. That would be a typical like single cycle memory access uh, or tree. Let's say that. Uh, then you would have stored three cycles here, stored three cycles here and then it will continue uh, doing the rest. And as you see, there, there's no load instruction in the actual function, it's just normal ALU instructions. So with the store buffer, we get the uh, advantage that you go one cycle, one cycle, and then you have the six cycles for the stores. So you can continue doing all this stuff. Well, here comes a... Uh, function call, so you really don't know what's happening there, but that might be a similar function, so you would have two, two more stores that would just go into the store buffer and it could continue. But let's ignore that it's a, it's a function call here. Uh, so you have already got to this stage without stalling the pipeline for the stores, and they are... Uh, uh, and you only have the, how, how many, you have like two clock cycles left to finish all the stores. So that's the that's how, how it can work because of how normal functions work that you do the stack stack store build up in the beginning of the function and then hopefully you don't get a load very close to to the to the stores or like yeah. The power needed to check if you have a collision between the load and the store, is it uh, proportional to the number of outstanding stores? Uh, I didn't quite get it. Well, As I said, this is, this is very, very simple. If just there has to be no stores at all in the buffer before you can do, even start doing the load. Oh, so the so stores, uh, all these stores are flushed out? Yeah. So there's a lot of improvements you, of course, can do to this. You can do it like, so you can read from the store buffer and check what's in it and see if the load actually goes to anything in it and like all kind of fancy stuff. But this was a start out and like simplest thing I could come up with and it showed to be like a, in, in normal programs, like a 10% performance increase. So it's pretty good for something simple like this, like this I think. Uh, and the next thing I did was add branch prediction and well or or 1k has delay slots which is kind of a already kind of a branch prediction uh, like a static the simplest form of it so why would I need to add a second second branch prediction function to it uh, well, if we look how 
conditional branch happens in R1K. You first have a set flag <coughs> instruction, then you have a branch to flag or branch if flag is set uh, instruction, and then some label where it jumps to. So, in terms of how this is in the pipeline, when you are resolving the branch, as I said, I moved the branches into the code stage, so they happen in the code stage. Uh, you would have the set flag instruction in execute, and you would have the branch in decode, and you would have the delay slot in fetch stage at the moment. And uh, this is all good. You could you kind of just connect the flag from from execute stage into into the decode stage and, and check check if it's set or not. But the problem was that that creates a pretty critical path from uh, from the register output and into the ALU because you you have to check is it equal, but that's not enough because you have to check which um, like set flag instruction you had. So it becomes a pretty large mux uh, for for that operation. So that path became the most critical path in the whole processor. So what I did was to then predict the flag in the code stage and then check in the execute stage was it, a, was it okay or not and uh, by doing that I can re register the flag so break up that long critical path and uh, the current implementation again I went to this for the simplest approach at least as a start just to get kind of the the thing in there and, and something that would break up the path. I wasn't so interested in making it super efficient now in the first stage of it. And it's, it's a simple static branch predictor where backwards branches are predicted as taken and forward branches as not taken. So, but I put it in, in tried to make it as modular and an interface that would fit into doing some more advanced like dynamic branch prediction. I can I can show this is basically the the whole branch prediction module. So it has like an interface with the flags uh, from decode stage and execute stage and then well here's the actual branch prediction. It's really simple in this like so here you would just add your fancy dynamic branch prediction if you if you'd like. Does it have to be asynchronous or can you register something in the branch predictor? Um, yeah, uh, you can't stall it so it has to be single cycle. I mean, it wouldn't, I don't think it would make much sense to make it multi-cycle, so that's kind of an... And what is the risk predictability? Uh, well, in this it's... Oh, it's uh, like, oh, well, it of course depends on how long the fetch is going to take and like memory accesses and stuff like that because you kind of fetch one and throw it away and take another. But if you get, if it's a cached access, it's one cycle. And then MMU. So first I briefly checked what kind of implementation was done in R1200 just to see what the minimum would be to like actually get something up and running. And uh, there I noticed that it's, as I say down here, that it's physically indexed and physically tagged, which isn't such a good idea if you're out for performance, because that means that every access you have to do it like serially, that you first do the lookup and then you get the, then you can do the cache lookup. Uh, so I wasn't happy with that, so I did a, 
virtually indexed and physically tagged implementation. And that way you can like take the virtual address and do the cache lookup and do the MMU lookup say or the TLD lookup at the same time and then use the match addresses to check if, if it was a cache hit or not. So that way you can do it like one cycle. Yeah, and the, yeah. The disadvantage of that is that you you have problems with aliasing and you if you don't handle it and like you can handle it in software but if you don't handle it, it puts con constraints on how large caches you can have, and uh, the two-way cache and eight kilobyte kilobyte of page tables. It's sixteen kilobyte. That's the maximum. But you can, if you increase the number of ways, you can increase the size too. So that's yeah, kind of page tables, page size. Huh? Page table, page size. Page size. Did I write page tables? Ah, yeah. <laughs> ah, good. Uh, yeah, so the page size is one. You know, right. uh, and I added the hardware TLB refill. Mostly as an... That was mostly as an academic kind of... I wanted to understand more how, how it worked. So um, it's not completely compliant with this specification uh, because well I kind of went first I went for the approach that the Linux kernel does and uh, that was completely out of what the spec does but then we had a couple of discussions on the mailing list and we came up with a scheme that would be like sensible for both the kernel and uh, hardware so that's what we have implemented now and uh, yeah, have to move forward with, with that to be update the spec specification and, and stuff like that. And uh, you need patches for the kernel. And uh, I have on my, my computer, or I have some local patches that makes this possible and stuff, but they aren't really cleaned up and I need to, I need to discuss more how this should be like software hardware interaction should be handled properly. And um, can I interject? Yeah. Uh, that if, when you go multi-core, mm. I believe one of the hardest problems is getting the TLB evictions to work. Yeah, that might be so. But so, it, so the specs that anticipate that. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. So <laughs> there's probably a lot of thinking going on well, that we have to do about that too, in that sense. Uh, but yeah, software refill is still supported. You can like even flip it off in the hardware, so it's not enabled there. Like, so it, it, it can work like like a old way. Uh, yeah, and just quick, quick introduction how it works. If someone isn't familiar with how hardware TLB refill works or like TLB refill in general. So the software just writes a register with the base pointer to the page table and uh, we're using two levels, two level page table and that means that a TLB refill done in hardware can be completed in two memory accesses like. Yeah, this is just to, to show you first do the, do the access with the base pointer and uh, bits 31 to 24 from the virtual address and you take that and get or from that when you read that from memory you get a pointer to the page table entry table or like the, the base pointer of that and then you index that with the virtual address and and when you read that from memory, you get the page table entry. Yeah. Uh, also, typically, when you uh, load the TLB, you have to evict something else, and that can be dirty because it can have modified guides and so on. Yeah. In it, which need then to be written out. So you've also got a store overhead. Yeah. When you do a TLB load. Yeah. True. Uh, now we currently. Uh, 
it doesn't do that, but it should be added. You're, you're completely right. And the reason is that the Linux implementation that we have is pretty uh, uh, naive that it flush all the TLDs, so, so we kind of don't have that problem. Yeah, so I thought I'd show a bit how that it actually works too, that I haven't broken completely. So we were running cappuccino yesterday, right? Yeah, yeah, so that's... And head, like, head of the tree. Head yeah, the yeah, so that's the master version. branch that you yeah. in GitHub. So I booted Linux, and what can you do? We can start... See if we can play some game, maybe. Yeah, I was supposed to have this connected to that, but it didn't have an HDMI connection, so it's on this this monitor. Does it show anything? Yes, yeah, a penguin. A penguin. Yeah, nice. that's good. <coughs> Are you running this on the Atlas board? Sorry. Yeah, on the Atlas board. Yeah. So the reason why I'm running it on this is that I have a pretty large <coughs> root, root file system, so, so I'm accessing it through NFS from my computer through the Ethernet, so. So you can play games from the 90s. <laughs> to do some thing el something else than just play games, so... <laughs> we recently got... Recently got. Yeah, got yes. Yeah. X working. Wow. This is cool. So. What, hmm. clock, what clock rate are you running? Huh? What clock have you got going on the FPGA? What clock? Your what clock rate you got? Uh, yeah, on this board I run it at 75 megahertz. It's actually you probably could run the CPU a bit faster. Uh, I, uh, you, I, you, you can run it about 100 megahertz if you don't have the MMUs enabled uh, on the the Nano board. That's where I have made most of the like frequency checks. But currently, the MMUs makes a bit of a critical path that I have to look into more. So 75 is about what you get with those. I think. Uh, yeah, so, what can you do here? Not much, I don't have so. I can check if the famous GLX gears can be run. Yeah. So it moves, but slowly. <laughs> <laughs> but there's still some, some bugs bugs that needs to be fixed in the, with X. If you kill a program, the X server crashes. But we have our friend Sebastian Macke has done a great deal of work on, on getting this working, actually, the whole X system. So the credit for that goes to him completely, actually. But anyway, that was what I wanted to show.
and just had a couple of more slides. So, where to go from here? There's still a lot of fun stuff you can do. There's some pipeline optimizations that you can do, and currently the multiply and shift operations are stalled. Like even if they are pipeline, like you have multiply that is three cycle pipeline, but the whole pipe or like yeah the whole process CPU pipeline stall when it performs those. So you could just let that continue, and then when they have moved up to right backstage, just write them straight in. And if there are any accesses earlier in the pipeline that would want to access those registers, you could just put in a bubble so they would just they would be stalled instead. So that way you could they, you could write software that wouldn't have or you could let the compiler figure out that reorder the instructions to, to not put put registered reads right after. Uh, and yeah, multi-way caches. I mentioned two ways are supported, but Stefan here has, has patches that add unlimited ways. And we're looking forward to Yeah, we'll clean them up and I think by the end of the week. Yeah, so that's that's really really great. Uh, and multi-way TLB you could do as well. Increase performance. And as I mentioned, the store buffer is really simple. You could do improve that. And the branch prediction, you could play with dynamic branch prediction, improve that. And again back to Stefan, the multi-core and cache coherency stuff is really interesting and, and I'm really I'm really excited about this stuff that, that we have been going on like last week or so with the, the his team were using more 1KX for for their work. I think it's it's really cool. Yeah. Um, do you think a second almost core fit on the nano device? I yeah, I think you could fit at least two on it if you. What was the usage report? We're not using. I think it's under. 50%. Yeah. So you're not using much with the op sock we built yesterday. Okay. Yeah. 42%, yeah. I think. So you could put another one or two on there, I think. Sounds good. Yeah. And then it's the normal, just trying to make it go faster, optimize it, every optimization, that kind of stuff still. Of course, there's also, can go way out, make a 64 bit implementation and then make multi-issue and all kind of fun stuff, but I mean, this is maybe things that are realistic at this point to start out and, like doing. And there's where it lives. So that's what I wanted to tell you.